Hello everyone, welcome to the presentation of our paper, React, a resource-centric access control system for web app interactions on Android. My name is Xin Zhang, and this work is collaborated with my advisor, Yifan Zhang from Binghamton University. So let's begin with some background. Today, we are seeing a trend of tighter integration of mobile applications and web content. Here's an example of such integration. This is a screenshot of Coral application on Android. The top and bottom parts are native UI components, and the content in the middle is from Coral Web Service. The UI element for showing the web content is called WebView. WebView can be considered as a mini web browser embedded in mobile apps to display web contents. It can achieve rich functionalities and provide good user experience. In contrast to the conventional web browser, WebView supports mechanisms for web contents to interact with apps. In this work, we have identified five mechanisms that are commonly used for web app interactions on mobile devices, as well as their vulnerabilities. The first mechanism is called JavaScript Java Bridge, JGB in short. JGB can expose conventional resources owned by the mobile apps to the web contents. Such resources include system resources like GPS or calendar, and app-defined resources like user home address or SSN. JGB is also convenient for mobile application developers to integrate their apps with web services, just as shown in the Coral example. To have a better understanding of how it works, let me show you an example. On the left side is the application code written in Java. As you can see, the app management web interface object is registered by calling at JavaScript interface. And there are two methods exposed using the annotation JavaScript interface. Here, the system resource IMEI is exposed by the method getDeviceIMEI, and the app defined resource SSN is exposed by the method getUserSSN. On the right side is the web JavaScript code. Once it's loaded by the web view instance, it can invoke the two exposed methods to get the user sensitive data. The major vulnerability here is a script can be from anywhere. The attacker can exploit this to steal private user information. As you can see, AC of the loaded web code is needed here. There are another two mechanisms also related to conventional resources, which are HTML5 APIs and file URL schemes. They allow accesses to conventional system resources, such as device geolocation, media stored on the device, or file system. The access control of, of them are either error prone or just missing. The fourth mechanism is called mobile deep linking. MDL can enhance mobile app user experience by allowing users to open specific locations within a mobile app. Here, we use Quarrel app again to show how it works. First, we did some search in the web browser and get a link related to Quora. After we click the link, it shows a dialog to let us open the link within the Aquaro app. If we accept it, the browser actually send an intent to the Quora app, and Aquaro will handle it and jump to that link directly. The vulnerability of MDL is that it can be exploited to launch UI spoofing and a phishing attack. Here's an example of such phishing attack. The initial app will first load the page P containing a phishing deep link. The phishing deep link could be something like this. The user clicks the phishing deep link. The initiator app will send an intent containing the phishing page to the target app D. After, uh, after app 
D received the intent without any check, it shows the phishing page. The phishing attack can be avoided by adding proper AC for validating the intent. The fifth mechanism is called web event hook. WEH provides a number of callback functions to intercept user activities. WEH is the only mechanism that enables web app interactions from application to web content. To show the vulnerability of WEH, here's an example. The user first log into a trusted site through the web view. The server will return a page for showing its content. Since the webview.load URL event has been controlled by the malicious app, it can inject a malicious HTML form and send it to the server, which could edit or delete the user information on the target site. This attack only possible because the AC is missing for the web event hooks. To solve the vulnerabilities introduced by the lack of proper AC in the five mechanisms we have summarized, the existing works focus on two types of design, either the origin-centric design or the code-centric design. The origin in the origin-centric design is a URI of web content, which is a combination of skin, host name, and port number. Resource requests are granted based on the region using whitelisting or blacklisting. This also leads to its limitation that you can only provide coarse granularity protection. Since the policy either fully accepts or declines the resource request from a region. The code-centric design is based on static analyzing the existing code to apply AC policies to individual Java or JavaScript methods that may lead to device resource accesses. This can provide finer AC granularity since it can treat resource requests from the same region differently. But the code-centric approach has its own limitations. This approach may not be able to correctly prevent unwanted accesses to app resources since method invocations may not necessarily lead to resource accesses, and it cannot treat different resource accesses from the same method invocation differently. And it's difficult uh, to extend it to work with other mechanisms like MDL, since the intent is not a conventional resource. To address these uh, limitations, we come up with the idea of resource-centric design. This is based on two key observations. First, our goal is to protect device resources from being accessed maliciously. So the most effective timing to perform AC is when device resource is actually accessed. And second, the attacker's goal is to obtain certain resources from system. So protection from the resource accesses can be a promising way to safeguard all the five mechanisms. In a summary, the idea of our work is to monitor the resource accesses and enforce AC policies when actual accesses occur. Let me use GGB as an example to show you the differences between these three designs. The render thread will handle the web content and parsing it. Right after the render thread obtains the region of the web content, the region-centric AC is enforced. Then the render thread will pass the ID and parameters of the invoked Java method to the background thread. The background thread will do some necessary preparation for the Java method invocation. After that, it calls the Java method. This is where the code-centric AC policy enforced. After the Java method invoke, it can send the resource request to the Android framework. And here is our resource-centric AC policies enforced. 
so that we can treat individual resource accesses differently even if they come from the same region or the same method. Here's a uh, table showing the resource and consumers of the five WAI mechanisms. For GGB, H5A, and FUS, the resources are all conventional resources like system resource or app-defined resource. The web view instances in MDL and web event hooks in WH are unconventional resources. Here's a figure showing our work comparison to the prior work. Our solution can work with all the five mechanisms coherently with the fine granularities at the resource level and without app or OS modification. And it can generate new or changing the existing AC policies during the runtime. Next, let me introduce our formal resource-centric policy language, RCPL, which is used to establish resource AC policies in our system. As shown here, it is described using the BNF notation. The rule is composed with three parts, resource, consumer, and a permission. Here, let me use some examples to show you how the RCPL is used in practice. Start with system resource. As you can see, the calendar GPS in the first part are the system resources then followed either by a web consumer or an app consumer. At the end, it's the granted permission. For uh, app-defined resource, the resource is in the form of app name with app-defined Java object methods. For web view instance resources, um, it specified web view with the corresponding application name. For web event hook resource, the resource is the combination of web server domain plus name of web event hook. Here's an overview of our React system. The core component is the, the React Manager. It is a regular user space Android application. Um, it provides a brokered execution environment for running on modified Android apps and intercept their resource requests, then forward to the policy components. There's an AC policy generator to create AC policies based on user feedback during runtime, then added the generated policy to the database. Policies can also be provided by app web uh, developers. There's um, an AC policy enforcer to perform the resource AC by consulting the database. And if the decision is positive, the resource request will be finally approved. Here for the implementation, I will only show some key points without going into details. Uh, the brokered execution environment is implemented following the Boxify app virtualization approach which allows the interactions between our modified apps and the OS to be monitored by a trusted app. This relies on Android binder replacement and here's a figure shows how it works. And we also use ART hooking for app defined resources. Here's a figure for it. If you are interested, you can go to our paper and the Boxify to find more details. We evaluate the React system on Google Nexus 5 with Android 7.0.1 installed. The table shows the web content loading time overhead of each mechanism. As you can see, it only introduces less than 20 milliseconds overhead of each time loading the web content. We also evaluated how much overhead our system brought to the app startup process. In this experiment, we selected five commercial apps. As a result, our system only brings a relative small overhead. Thank you for listening and feel free to ask me any questions.